Uh, ben, thanks for taking time for us. Absolutely, Rick. It's good to be with you. You know, I look at this, and, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to a couple of the, the drivers uh, who are part of this uh, this campaign to, to get people properly classified. And the stories that they tell are just, I, I mean, on one vein, heartbreaking, but on the other side, just maddening. Well, I, I think if you look at it, uh, you know, what we're dealing with in Savannah, Georgia, uh, we have about, uh, we have several thousand workers, uh, port truck drivers there at the Port of Savannah that is a massive economic engine for this region. Uh, and for the entire country, really, it's the fourth most busiest port in the United States. And uh, these these drivers come from an industry that, you know, prior to 1980, they were employees. You know, the trucking companies hired them as employees, and as such, they had all the rights of employees from workers' comp to unemployment, and obviously the right to organize. Uh, and since deregulation in 1980, I mean, the bottoms fell out, and what we see, you know, with misclassification is that an employer calls you an independent contractor. Well, you know, you know, then it's your burden uh, to prove them otherwise when it should be the other way. The, yep. the employer should treat you as a worker and give you workers' rights uh, without you having to, you know, sue them or wage a mighty struggle like what the Teamsters are engaged in in Savannah and Los Angeles, Seattle, New Jersey, and elsewhere um, to try to, you know, push for legislation. Uh, to reverse this and to get some labor law enforcement to say that, uh, you know, these workers deserve basic um, labor protections. That's what we're fighting for, Rick. So help walk me through this because, you know, I go back to, you know, my, my grandfather during, the, you know, came back from the war, uh, you know, yeah. World War II, learned to drive a truck, made a decent living uh, as, a, as a Teamster for a number of years. I was able to make uh, a decent living for some, more than 20 years uh, carrying a, a Teamster's car, driving a truck. Uh, you know, how did the, that go wrong? I mean, you know, they were you know, b- made to be good, solid, middle-class kind of jobs that you could support a family on. Uh, when did this really start to go south? Where I'm looking at people making $9 an hour, driving an 80,000-pound vehicle up and down the roads. Uh, that, to me, is well, insane. Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, when you, when you talk about removing government regulations over industries like, you know, the trucking industry, uh, you leave it, you know, the law of the jungle. And, and the victims have been the people that do the work every day. And, you know, in this case, thousands of port drivers and ports all across this country, I tell you, there's probably no point in our entire economy that is more important uh, to everything else uh, than where the ports of entry, the seaports. And these drivers uh, should be making a decent living because they're doing very important work for all of us. Um, but, in fact, you know, the wages in Savannah are below $9 an hour. And, and what we're working, you know, trying to prove with the United, uh, U.S. Department of Labor in, in Savannah is to show that these workers actually make below the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Um, when you account for how much they have to pay out of pocket for, you know, um, from, you know, expenses from tires to fuel, uh, and in many cases, they lease the trucks from the trucking companies that are making trucking pay- you know, payments on their trucks as well. Yeah, that's that's the most perverse so part of all this. That you know, yeah. they the, the companies have done a masterful job of of shifting the responsibilities onto the people who are who are least able to uh, to shoulder them. And and I, I've had a couple of people go, well, you know, Rick, well, why do they take the jobs? Why do why do they do it? And you know, it's one of those questions that you know. The people who have bloated self images of themselves that I would just go somewhere else. How do you answer that to them? How do you answer well, they, that you took the job, uh, just you know, lump it? Well, the answer the answer is as I was raised and as many people were taught is that you go out. You know, if you're a work, come from a working family, you go out there and you get a skill. You get a you get a, you learn a craft. And in this case, going out and get a commercial driver's license is a skilled job. I mean, it's a job where you're, you know, have your life in, in your hands and other people's lives in your hands. And when you're, um, you know, working less than paycheck to paycheck, bringing home $200 a week, you don't really have a whole lot of money to keep, you know, up the best quality truck out there on the road. Sure. You know, you're, you're working long hours, stressed out. Um, so it's a public safety hazard. And that's one thing that the big rig overhaul report pointed out um, and that the previous report pointed out is that there is broad – impacts in the community to go beyond just the port drivers and their family, which are many. Um, but the community in, is impacted by it, too. So 
the person says that you should just hop over, you know, to the other side and get you another job. Well, you know, um, these folks have been sold the dream of being going into business for yourself and being your own boss. And uh, that's the whole mythology around owning your own truck is that you can go out there and, um, you know, start up your own business, call it, you know, Rick's Trucking Company, and you can, you know, haul some containers. And, you know, that's what these drivers are told that they're going to be doing. And, in fact, they sign exclusive haul agreements with these trucking companies that require them in many cases in these lease agreements to haul exclusively for these trucking companies where they're not like a contractor, a plumbing contractor, or, you know, a, you know, a housing contractor that can – pick what jobs they do and charge their rates. In fact, the trucking companies dictate to them what their rates are, and it's a total um, it's a total form of exploitation, and, and we often refer to it as sharecroppers on wheels because, in fact, these workers are paying for the right to work, and we're seeing it in a lot of different industries, um, and constructions eat up with it, and, you know, the building trades have been fighting this for many years, and we're seeing it also in uh, the production industry. IOTC is fighting this in Georgia and elsewhere, and that's and that's why we're seeing movements um, in multiple states to rein this thing in. And and I'll tell you, there's another side to it that is not just about justice for workers, but states are looking at this issue because it's a revenue problem. Right. Um, e- even in very conservative states like Georgia, the Georgia Department of Labor currently owes $1 billion to the federal government because Georgia – legislature had passed several years of an unemployment tax holiday that drained the the reserves so when the financial crisis hit obviously georgia workers were laid off and out of work um and so there's a billion dollar deficit to the federal government and instead of attacking unemployment benefits for georgia workers as they're doing um they should be looking at trucking companies and saying you should pay your fair share. These trucking companies aren't paying it to the unemployment tax system. Yeah, that's uh, an important. They should be. That's an important point to bring up. Uh, uh, the fact that you know you've you've moved the the responsibility for these, for unemployment, for workers' comp, for for a whole bunch of things off of the the corporate roles and onto the backs of the employees, and then not at all. So then the state ends up getting shortchanged, uh, and the entire community gets shortchanged. And you know, going back to the answer that you know that. Uh, I've given for why not go across the street and find another job is when you have these bad actors, when you have folks who are are doing these things, misclassifying employees, cheating the system, cheating their workers, it's it's an entire culture. And, you know, it's not easy just to go across the street because the guy across the street, in order to keep keep up with the guy who's who you're leaving, he's got to do the same thing. So we've got they've got this this spiraling downward of, of one bad actor pulling everyone down, even if everybody else wants to do the right thing, in order to compete, they've got they've almost they almost have to if they don't even if they don't want to they almost have to just to compete. Well, I mean, Rick, I, I'm inspired by people like you had on last week, Carol Colley, who's a uh, a mother and a hard worker yep. uh, and dealing with all kinds of. Um, you know, mistreatment out there just to try to raise her family. And, you know, if there was other trucking jobs available, she'd be on it. You know, uh, if you go out and you work for another outfit, um, unfortunately, in the trucking industry, um, uh, you're, 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 you have a hard time, uh, you know, ultimately making it work over a number of years, you know, having good benefits, having a voice on the job, having safety on the job. But I'm very proud of these workers in Savannah that are joining with, for the first time, port drivers in other cities. And in in Los Angeles, there's a very advanced organizing campaign that the teamsters are leading that is bringing together both misclassified drivers and employee drivers together to push forward and try to uh, change um, the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And obviously, they're dealing dealing with a very different political climate, but they've gotten the California Department of Labor over there to really go after some of these trucking companies that – are intentionally misclassifying workers and denying them their basic rights. Um, as you know, and I'm sure you've reported on your program, there was a strike last fall in Los Angeles, and the workers are taking a stand there. And last, um, this earlier this week in Vancouver, Canada, poor truck drivers went on strike as well, and they were joined by um, the newly formed, you know, Canadian Auto Workers Union. They 
merged with another union there in Canada, and there's union workers and misclassified workers up there that are coming together. So there's a lot of examples of this, the taxi cab industry, um, the chauffeur's industry is also another example of it. Um, there's a number of industries that are impacted by misclassification, and I think it's an example of how you just race to the bottom where corporations and even small trucking companies and other firms are looking for ways to make labor contingent and easily exploitable in the gray areas of the law. Uh, and to both um, exploit, exploit loopholes in government regulations around their own tax requirements, uh, avoiding unemployment tax, Social Security tax, workers' comp. Um, but you can also see it in the use in the manufacturing sector of temporary workers. And we're seeing that in both warehouse and manufacturing here in Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, uh, the Glock gun manufacturer employs a majority of temporary workers over years. Um, these are perma temps, um, people that work for years with, you know, without any rights, without any voice, without the right to organize a union. Uh, and we're seeing this um, really proliferation of it. And we've, if you're classified as a temp, they can't count you as a manufacturing worker. Um, and so we're seeing uh, this whole uh, use of workers uh, and classifying them that it makes them easy to be exploited on the job. But the encouraging sign is that you see unions like the Teamsters Union that I belong to, obviously, and I work for as an organizer here in Georgia that are looking at these workers and saying, we're going to have to find a way. These workers deserve a voice on the job. They deserve justice. And we're going to find a way, even if that means they're not immediately members of our union, we're going to help them build campaigns even in difficult places like here in Georgia where we can move forward legislation uh, and we can begin to, try to change the labor law enforcement in our state. And just this past week, uh, two state senators co-sponsored two separate bills um, around employee misclassification in Georgia. And I tell you, Rick, it's been a long time since labor uh, or other progressive allies who are advocating for working folks have been able to introduce legislation. Now, that legislation will be brought up again next year, uh, and we're going to continue to fight for it. But it's important for us to move forward a positive agenda yep. um, and get these folks um, engaged in uh, their own issues. And I think we're, we've achieved that uh, in our organizing. We're going to keep on doing it. Yeah, I mean, that's to me, that's what's got to happen all across the country. And, you know, I look at the broken nature of our labor laws in this country and have been saying for years uh, that, you know, most of our labor laws are 50 years old and need to be need to be looked at again, especially this misclassification stuff. Uh, the, the 1099 employees, you know, at some right. point we've got to be as a society say this isn't what we want. This uh, this idea of permanent temps, uh, these third party logistic companies who who usurp uh, abilities to organize. All of these things have to be looked at and reevaluated and I think changed. Uh, I think they have to be fundamentally changed. And I think that we have to this. Uh, it's not it's not even breaking away from things that and our values that we know are true. Uh, we fought, and everything about our country, everything that makes our country great, is that we have constantly fought to expand, expand <laughs> rights to more people, is to expand rights to more people, and to ensure that nobody's left out of rights, and that there shouldn't be a worker, there shouldn't be a parenthesis around workers' rights, except for these people, except for people that are classified as independent contractors, except for people that are temp except for agricultural workers or, or housekeepers, you know, except for people that are undocumented or except for these people. And, and as long as we have that in our labor market, we're going to have a bottom. And as long as we allow that bottom not to have any floor, there's always going to be pressure and competition in the labor market that's going to drive down wages. Yeah. We can't say that we're going to have poverty wages if you work. Because uh, if you accept poverty wages on that end, there's going to be pressure on you when it comes up for a raise. So, you know, we're all tied up in it, Rick, and I'm glad that, you know, that there's a lot of organizing going on.